Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we're seeing people coming in. Um, I think we're close to 30 participants. So I'm just looking to Alejandra, when you're ready to start, uh, I think we can, we can start in a short bit. Hi everyone, good morning and thank you for being here. So welcome to today's session when we talk with Guyanese Civil Society Organization. Uh, so if some of them were here yesterday, I will do the same. I will introduce our team uh, that is DAR, and I will thank the opportunity that is given to us to facilitate this session. So my name is Alejandra Negre, and I work in DAR, and I say hi on behalf of our organization that is called Right Laws and Environmental Resources, DAR in Spanish. And uh, we are a civil society organization that work based in Peru and is constantly working with improving governance in the Amazon. So here my colleagues and I have been following up with different initiatives that we are going to discuss today. One of them is the EITI that we have been following for the several years now. Um, that has been working as part of National Commission of the EITI and also uh, in a regional level with our executive director, Cesar Gamboa, who integrates the EITI board. We also follow up with initiatives like the ESCASO agreement and with the ratification in Peru and the regional, regional level. And we work with different civil society campaigns to talk about the importance of the ESCASO agreement. We also work with different initiatives with civil society, I'm sorry, with indigenous organizations, such as the Defenders Program of the Coordinator of Indigenous Organizations in the Amazon region. And all of these initiatives are um, going to one goal, our main goal is to make a more just space in the Amazon for us that work in this extractive sector. So we hope this session helps with that. And without further ado, uh, I welcome you to today's session and leave you with Rafael, who will be the one who will help us lead the session today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, welcome to, to everyone. Um, so yeah, great to see some of you again and others for the first time. Um, I'm Rafael. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of DAR as well, uh, co-facilitating together with my colleague um, Susan. So we're going to uh, walk you through uh, today. So I'm just going to hand it over to Susan uh, briefly to, to present herself as well. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Susana Kraut. Um, I'm here in La Paz, Bolivia, in the same uh, time schedule as you are. Uh, and it's nice to meet you all. I haven't been in the workshop yesterday, but I will be here today. And it's an, uh, a theme that's also very relevant for Bolivia. So it's a great pleasure to be able to co-facilitate this workshop and help it uh, to, um, to make it an interesting dialogue. So nice to meet you all and hope we'll have a great morning together. Thanks, Susan. So we're a pretty big group of people and we have a pretty filled schedule. So uh, I would like you to invite you to, to present yourself uh, in the chat. And I would like you to do that in, in uh, two different ways. Just tell us who you are, uh, what are you working on? And tell us what you feel is one of the biggest challenges for Guyana uh, in this area of work, okay? So tell us in the chat quickly who you are and what is one of the biggest challenges for Guyana in this uh, line of work. So we can see who's here, but we're also connecting a little bit to, um, to the issues we're gonna talk about today. So um, whilst you're doing that, I'll, um, I'll comment that we have a, a pretty uh, strong program with different issues we're going to deal with. I see some people coming in still as well. Um, and seeing some of you already commenting in, uh, in the chat. So we have someone here from Trinidad and Tobago as well. So that's really interesting for our exchange. This has been a week full of activities, I understand, with a lot of different opportunities to hear from different uh, realities and regions. And that's kind of one of the approaches for the workshop today as well to really have a space of exchange where we can learn from each other, hear from each other, um, and, um, and understand the challenges we are facing in, in the sector. So waiting for your, your quick presentations in the chat. We also wanted to say if there are people, hi Sarita, it's great to see you from the Guyana Responsible Parenthood Association working in the field of sexual and reproductive health. That's great, Cielo Magno. Um, he's going to share with us as well. 
uh, from the Philippines. Great that you're here. We would also encourage you, if you are able to do that, um, um, put on your cameras. It's just a lot nicer to see each other. Uh, you know, in normal times, we would be in a workshop together and we would be drinking coffee and tea together. So what brings us closest to this is just making sure we can see each other and hear from each other. I'm seeing several people there. Simone, I also see Annette. Uh, Nancy, who was here together as well yesterday as well from Suriname, so it's great to see that we have an interesting group from different uh, countries um, from the region. I'm seeing Rolinda putting on her camera, and great to see you. Welcome as well. Okay, so we have three hours to work together, and we wanted to start with something uh, really simple. This is going to be a participatory space. We are very aware that we have people here from many different sectors, many different experiences who bring in a lot of knowledge to the space. Uh, we have invited some external speakers from other countries to share their experiences and to kind of feed into uh, your uh, discussion. So what we wanted to start with is just knowing a little bit more about what you're thinking of the issues that we will be talking about today. So I'm putting a, a quick link in the chat, which is a Menti, uh, it's a Menti meter link. So I would ask you to go there to do click on the link I'm sending through. Uh, and when you go there, you should be able to see a question coming up. Uh, and I'm going to show that question as well. So if you do enter on the click, it should take you um, to the Mentimeter, which is here. OK, that's great, which is here. and. I would like you to answer those questions you will see there. there. Um, so the first question would be, tell us quickly, what is the sector or the issues you are working on? Just to have an idea of who's in the space and what are you working on? Please let me know if there's any problem. You, there can always be technical problems, but if they're not, there's a question and you can answer this. What are the issues, the sector you are working on related to the issues of today? Religious society through a community-based NGO. Okay, that's great. We're seeing several other people uh, more on top coming from very diverse kind of sectors, which is really, really interesting. So I'm going to share you the program for today then. Um, and that's going to be here. Okay, so. So today is our uh, civil society dialogue on extractive sustainability and human rights. Um, we have a program that's more or less, that has three different uh, elements to it. We're gonna start with three presentations um, on three important initiatives working on uh, these issues. So we're gonna start with a dialogue on EITI uh, between Cesar Gamboa, um, Cielo uh, Magno and Maria Lobacheva, who are going to talk about different experiences with EITI uh, around the world and to give you an idea on what this tool and process is useful uh, for. Then secondly, we're going to have uh, Thomas Severino, who's going to talk about the Escazú Agreement or Treaty, which you know is a, an important process moving forward in the region. And thirdly, we're going to have the ILO Convention uh, uh, 169 and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples by Daniel Serriega. So we're going to have presentations on these three different issues. Um, in each case, we're going to uh, have some time for questions and dialogue. Then we're going to do a break, important in these uh, pandemic times, and we would have a second um, block to uh, do group work and to see how these initiatives can apply to uh, your work. So the idea is to have really a space for exchange, to get inputs from other parts of the world, and to see how this can be useful for Guyana and for the other countries that are, uh, are present here. So we're going to start with uh, the first space, um, where we're going to have a dialogue between three different people. So this is going to be facilitated by Cesar Gamboa, who's uh, working at DAR. I yesterday learned he's not the founder of DAR, but he's played an important role in this organization. He's an expert in constitutional law, political science, human rights and environmental law and indigenous people's rights and worked in many places around the world. He's also a board member of the uh, um, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, uh, EITI, since 2016. 
and he's going to facilitate the conversation. The conversation is going to be with uh, Cielo Magno, who's an assist, associate professor in the University of the Philippines School of Economics. And he's part of the international board of the uh, extractive industry transparency initiative as well. And will share some experiences from a very different part of the world, but with uh, similar lessons. And we will also have Maria Lobacheva. She's a social, uh, civil society representative in the International Board of the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative and the program director at the public association uh, ECHO. Her work includes managing a research and advocacy strategy to promote transparency and citizen participation. Uh, she has been working on the implementation of the EITI in Kazakhstan for 15 years now, and she's also a moderator of the dialogue platform of the EITI. So uh, a lot of interesting uh, experience there that's gonna be shared with you for about uh, 20 minutes. If you have questions, comments, remarks, you can do that at any time uh, through the chat. So we can have them present as well. And we will do a round of Q and A after at the end of it. So Cesar, I'm handing it over to you uh, to lead on this uh, part. Please go. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Rafael, for your kindly words. Um, I have an, a, an, a brief presentation just to put some concepts and I, I, I don't know, so the, the framework about the EITI experience and then uh, I'm going to start with a dialogue with uh, Cielo and Maria and thank you so much Cielo and Maria because we start to date I like a five or six hour ago because today was the second day of the EITI board meeting so the, I, I think that in the case of Cielo Maybe it's 10, 10 p.m. from Manila time, so I, I want to to run very quickly. I want to present my yeah very briefly. Yesterday we talked about about the legacy of the extractive sector governance, some challenges or problems. There is like an attention between I don't know more regulation, more pressing of the of the of the state or the public authorities in the cycle of extractive sector versus or against to the auto regulation of the market. Uh, try to promote that the private sector regulate themselves, uh, applying new standards or new uh, indicators uh, to avoid or to reduce uh, social and environmental impacts, for example. No? We can see these challenges, these changes in the, for example, the reform of the safeguard of the multilateral development banks like a World Bank or IDB you know, in the last, I don't know, decade. Another tension is that uh, how the investment uh, are implemented in, on the field in, 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 in the, in, at local level, uh, impacting with uh, the communities and obviously uh, ecosystem, uh, in, for example, in the case of the Amazon rainforest and how affect the human rights, especially not just for uh, in the case of the indigenous people, the free private for consultation among other territorial rights. No, and the, th the third one is a, that we can see in the last I don't know, especially in South America, <clears throat> many many cases of corruption, especially from the infrastructure sector. Um, we saw that we need to improve the the, uh, the regulation and especially the, the transparency of the operations. At local level, but also at national level, no try to change the legal framework that allows, in the last decade, many cases of bribes and corruptions in, uh, in as in a, as Francisco Duran said, uh, there is a Peruvian author about political science uh, that the the capture of the state, no. So, I think that these three issues that I want to raise is uh, are related to the EITI. Um, uh, and especially because the idea is try to improve how the, 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 the our governments, our countries uh, manage the natural resources and the extractive, uh, the extractive operation. No? So we can see that we can attack tr trying to improve the decision-making phase and also the implementation phase, trying to include an, a sustainable and a human rights perspective, but also an, a governance perspective. No? So we, we, we can, talk about a little bit about the, of, all of these issues, but I think that in the case of EITI and from the DAR perspective, but also from as an uh, EITI board member, I, I, I couldn't see 
in the last year how try to how the civil society that that participate in the EITI in different levels at local level at national level in the in the at this stratospheric space that is the the, the international boards uh, of the EITI uh, we discuss with the private sector and the governments that implement the EITI in each country the way that we can improve the governance of the strategic sector. So I, I, I know that I don't have much time to, to, to explain uh, each one of these the standards that the EITI, uh, as I told you before, we met in, 20, in 20, 2013, uh, 20 years ago, uh, the, this international initiative started with this dialogue between private sector, civil society organization and the governance. So I think there is a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, um, obviously uh, learn lessons from, I don't know, good changes or, or, or also bad changes. And it's very important at least, I think so that we can share this experience from two, per, two people uh, from Cielo and Maria that they work, I don't know, in the last decade in the ITI issues, especially at national level, because they work in the multi-stakeholder group from Kazakhstan and, and the Philippines too. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna stop my, this briefly presentation. Uh, I don't know if you, Cielo and Maria can turn off your camera because I would like to, to see you, but also to, to start asking a, an, an a first question about the importance of the civil society participation in the ITI, you know? So uh, yesterday I, I had the chance to talk to a Guyanese civil society MSG member that participated at, in, in Guyana in the ITI implementation. And they asked me, um, Obviously, in another country, we received the same doubts and questions. What is the leverage of the C of the EITI? You know? So, all the time, maybe they has the, the same doubts. No, what is the importance that civil society can participate? But thinking, what is the leverage of, of the importance of the EITI in the in the EITI countries? So, I don't know if you, Cielo, want to to start uh, respond. Hi, Cesar. Um, yeah, on the first point, uh, coming from the, basing on the experience of the Philippines, we just joined EITI in 2013, even if we were invited to do it as early as 2008, 2009. Uh, and and uh, it's, uh, it's the same reason as other countries in Latin America. There's a skepticism on what EITI can do in the country, particularly in the Philippines where the issue of the, the big issues are environmental and the negative social impact of mining. So when EITI was introduced, uh, there are lots of discussions on whether this is just going to whitewash the real issues of, of the mining in the country. But uh, following a different conversations, the civil society finally decided that we're going to engage in EITI. And the advantage of that is we are including another lens in terms of the debate. So we are not giving up the issues of environment, social, but at the same time also engaging the companies on economic issues. And we're also using EITI as a platform to access all information and data that we can use to improve the sector, make the sector accountable, and even close some of the mining companies whom we think are violating the law. So what we're doing is use the data of EITI to actually close some of the mining companies and file complaints against mining companies. So I think that's a, a very good justification on why we should engage at EITI. <laughs> No, th thank you so much, Cielo. I, I understand completely what you said, because the most important thing for civil society is how to strategize EITI as an a tool. It's not the the co It's not an outcome. It's 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 just an a tool that you can use. But first, you have to to make your strategy. If not, it's yes. not possible to, to use. I can it. give you um three three examples. Three examples, uh, two exam concrete examples, because in EITI we're required to disclose contracts, and in the contracts of mining companies you can e easily see coordinates of um, the operation. So by entering it using Google Maps, you can see whether using satellite 
the, the satellite images in Google, you can see whether companies are operating within the boundaries of what is indicated in the contract. And if they go beyond that, you can already file a complaint against these mining companies. The second one is taking advantage of what we recently included in EITI, the disclosure of environmental and social information. So in one company, which is renewing its contract with the government, we did an analysis of the water information that they're disclosing, and we were able to establish that they're the ones causing water shortage in that community. So the community filed an opposition on the renewal of a contract of that company, so that company's um, contract is still pending. So those are concrete um, contributions of EITI data in the debate and the extractive. Yeah, thank you so much, Cielo. So we stop here now with you, and now we can talk to a little bit with Maria. I don't know if Maria, you are there. Yes, Cesar. Yes. Hi, okay. I'm here. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for your time. So, I I I want to know more about the the, the challenge in in the civil society related to EITI in Latin America. I think so. How to to bring I don't, I don't want to say new people, but another stakeholder that can see EITI as an, a chance and as, as an opportunity. So, uh, for example, I think yesterday there too, uh, the Guyanese Civil Society asked me uh, how to link, for example, indigenous communities or young people that can participate and can see EITI and a leverage an opportunity to raise your own point of view or your own perspective about the extractive sector governance. I don't know, what do you think about how to create some kind of interest of the society in general to participate in the multi-stakeholder multi group uh, as an, uh, I don't know, an a broad process of uh, participation of the civil society. Uh, thank you, Cesar, for this question. It's a really interesting question, and it's a, I think it's a problem in many countries. And uh, I think it's necessary to approach the issue of creating interest in ATI in a complex manner, uh, to think over a more strategic attitude. So civil society representative and the MSG need to represent a re fairly wider community. So the approach to the ATI engagement needs to be strategic. And it, it can include dissemination information, increasing ongoing engagement with local civil society groups, um, implementing the ATI on the subnational level, building strategic partnership, and possibly creating the MSG at the subnational levels. And talking about the disclosed data, we must remember that people are interested in what concerns them directly. This can be information about the infrastructure, infrastructure projects, about uh, the, uh, affecting the environment, local content in procurement and deployment and financial support of education. In addition, in many countries, EITI is one of the few uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, dialogue platforms where the voice of civil society matters. It is often through the MSG, um, people can bring the information to the government and companies' attention. And this argument is uh, very attractive to many ATI participants from civil society. And third thing, I think uh, we sh should demonstrate every success story. If the ATI process ha has helped to change something, even in one particular case, it is important to share such success so others could see it and maybe use it in their experience. Thank, thank you, Maria. I think that it's very useful for us to understand how, for example, EITI is in a tool in the, in the European Asian countries, uh, and especially because <clears throat> from Latin America, we, we, we don't know much about what is going on in, in, this, re, in this region and vice versa. No? So my, my other question is about the, in some countries, and we know because of the experience of the ITI, there are some constraints of civic space. No? In, in a soft way or in a hard way, the government tried to to reduce the civic space, uh, to try to create some limitations in, to 
to try to interfere in the operation of the civil society, even in, in, in many, many soft ways. Um, uh, one, I would like to know more about what is going on in Kazakhstan or in, in the European Asian countries that are part of the ITI. For example, yesterday asked me uh, uh, another colleague from the Kujanese MSG member that is it possible that the government can control how the civil society or organization organize themselves to select their own representative. So have you, have you seen any case from your side that the government try to interfere how the civil society organization organize itself to select, or I don't know, to organize, uh, to, I don't know, in, in some way or another? Uh, you know, Cesar, um, in this case, CITI standard could be really helpful because it uh, um, clearly says that the government should create the conditions for civil society to participate in ITI free, freely, and uh, civil society um, must have the right to appoint its own representatives uh, free from any su suggestion or coercion. And um, every civil society organization in every country can use this requirement of the standard to protect themselves. You know, in the very beginning of EITI implementation in Kazakhstan, our government tried to use uh, uh, GONGO to participate in EITI instead of in, independent NGO. And we just uh, uh, woke out with the um, press conference and made a statement. And after it, the companies take our side and uh, uh, we together insisted on that we nominated our representative in MSG independently from our government. So in this case, the standard really helps. And uh, uh, you know, in the Eurasia region, I don't know any case uh, in the last years when government tried to interfere the election process from the civil society. Thank you so much, Maria. So I'll return back to Cielo. So maybe Cielo, as uh, and with Maria and Cielo, uh, uh, we are part of the validation committee that uh, is an, a mechanism of the ITI family to certificate or to assess how the ITI is implemented in the in each country. So uh, we saw, I don't know, in the last six years, uh, many cases. Uh, not not so much, but I think. The third part of the ITI family has some governance problems. Um, there are and, uh, some some cases are very very tricky. Um, and so, uh, the, the question for Cielo is: uh, in some way, EITI is a good tool to raise your voice uh, to at least to, to to try to I don't know make an, a complaint to the international level when a government, for example, in the case of Myanmar, or maybe Honduras, if we, we want to talk about the Latin America region. Do you think at the end, Cielo is useful to use EITI to raise this kind of constraint of civic space in the EITI countries? Um, definitely, because, um, well, one, it's very clear that the core principle of EITI is that we should have a strong civic space for civil society to freely participate in EITI. Um, and I think the platform that EITI provides us is a very good opportunity. You know, countries want to look good. And if we're going to raise it at the international level, saying that our government is violating our rights and they're shrinking civic space, it calls the attention of the world. And, and it creates bad reputation for governments. And this 
um, reputation is very important in terms of accessing other resources, like when they need to borrow or attract additional investment in their countries. And therefore, I think uh, being part of EITI and taking advantage of this platform may be useful in creating pressure for governments to improve the situation and um, to respect human rights at the national level. Thank you, Cielo. Um, another question. I, I, maybe we, we, we can raise more critics about EITI experience, but I think that there are some uh, good achievements that we, we, we made in, in the EITI. For example, the inclusion of the environmental standard in the 2019 global conference. Uh, I think it's a good, I don't know, achievement that we, we can share, but the other thing that I think that the, the, the main challenge of EIT how to how to link with uh, at local level, no? try to generate some local impacts, especially how to involve the, the communities. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that about the in the in the validation process because we, uh, in the new validation model that is, this is uh, the assessment that I mentioned before. There is an, uh, a specific mention to include in this assessment how the affected communities can participate in, in the assessment and the, in the sign up process too. We include if a country wants to be a, a member of the ITI has to in, start on a consultation process, including local communities. So right. do you think that the ITI is addressing to, to include uh, uh, local actors and also to, to improve uh, its impact uh, at local level? Right, and I think you, you um, you stated a very good premise. There are a lot of challenges and EITI is far from ideal because as we know, there are three stakeholders, uh, four in the case of, uh, of uh, international EITI who are trying to balance uh, interests in uh, shaping EITI. And I'm sure everyone would experience the same at the national level and it's a struggle. But uh, I agree with you that we have some wins, the social and environmental reporting are examples of that. And recently in the validation, uh, it's now part of the validation process to for the, the validation, the, the secretary to check whether communities are engaged in the EITI reporting, because we know that at the MSG, we only require a few uh, representatives. So now the EITI secretariat at the national level will have to engage a community that are hosting the, the extractive sector and to make sure that they are involved in the discussion. Also in the sign up stage, the coalitions also have to show that there's broad based support in the uh, implementation of EITI in the country. So you're right, uh, there's a very good opportunity here to engage the grassroots. If you would remember, even before this um, changes in the validation, the entry point for engagement at the community level would be at the minimum outreach consultation and translation of documents into relevant uh, languages in the country, which sometimes national MSGs are not able to do. So to act to, to now say that they have to actively engage communities is a, a very good direction. The other option, um, the other strategies, this might not be in the EITI, it's explicitly in the EITI, but if you have strong civil society advocacy at the national level, you can actually push the implementation of EITI um, to be replicated at the subnational level. So you, you can have a national level MSG and some national MSGs in the provinces or in the region. So, and that would get, give or create additional space for people to participate. Thank you, Thilo. That's right. And, and another challenge that we face as an civil society organization, the ITI, is that, is that obviously all these reports that Maria and, and you, uh, uh, we, we assess all the time that this is stratospheric level of the discussion are very technical, no? So you, you have to, to bring some capacity, technical capacity to understand <clears throat> not just revenue expenses, but all these policy and legal framework that EITI create and assess the how the, 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 the countries implement. What, what, what kind of solution you can find for civil society to, to to face this 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 challenge. 
Yeah. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm an associate professor in the university. When I was um, leading the Publish What You Pay Coalition in the Philippines, the model that we tried to adopt is to establish a sort of a cooperation at the local level to establish the linkages between state universities and colleges and then the, the, um, the community organizations and the national level NGOs. Why? Why that cooperation? Because we want them to be able to talk at the local level and share their knowledges and knowledge and skills. Because, for example, as you said, EITI is a very technical report, so you will need to tap the skills of um, different individuals to be able to utilize it effectively. So, um, when when we started our EITI in the Philippines, and, and you know that. Uh, 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 this is an old trick of companies and they do it they do this even at the international level right they try to intimidate <laughs> try to intimidate civil society and they would say that we don't know what we're talking about because we are not mining engineers right so when we started EITI in the Philippines we made sure that uh, our civil society representatives have lawyers we also have engineers and I am an economist to make sure that we set a very high benchmark when we start EITI but eventually, uh, we are moving towards, after setting that benchmark, we are moving towards a greater representation of indigenous people in the MSG and uh, broadening that participation at the subnational level. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cielo. Um, I don't know, Maria, you want to add something about how to make easy EITI language for, for the people? <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, people are really interested in what happens at their places. And uh, we use different approaches to uh, translate uh, the ATI dry number reports from, uh, from this uh, language of numbers to the normal human language, understandable language. And um, if, uh, sometimes we use in, uh, online tools like vis visualization. And uh, also, uh, many countries publish uh, popular version of reports. But we also using, um, uh, as Sierra said, we cooperate with other experts and we provide some information on payments and ecologists uh, taking this data. And um, for example, we collected information uh, on environmental payments. Uh, that company pay for the harm to the environment, environment. and we analyze this. We count how many comp uh, money companies pay to the on the local level and on the central level, and then we analyze data how many uh, ma how much money do the government spends on the environmental protect uh, protection programs on the local level and the central level. And now ecologists using this data to campaign for the more fair uh, spendings on the environment protected, uh, protecting programs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, Cesar, um, there, there's, then... one thing, there's one thing that I want to, to mention because sometimes the EITA report is so long and that's why um, it's important to involve the communities that are hosting the mining companies so that you can assign <laughs> the reading of all the reports, especially if you have multiple mining companies. But what is interesting that I want to share, when we started disclosing environmental documents in the Philippines, we decided to read one of the environmental document, the environmental impact assessment that they submitted. And what is interesting is that when we read this document, and this company has been approved already, um, in their EIA, invent the inventory of animals that will be protected or impacted by mining, they identified an animal. Um, I can I can one one of those snakes, and then realized we realized that it's only endemic in South America. We don't even have that in the Philippines, but it's in the list of EIA. So we realized that they just copied existing EIA and submitted it to the agency, right? So. <laughs> It's not, some of the documents are highly technical, but it's interesting to just focus on one company sometimes and then look at the financials and make an, a statement about that company and that will trigger a good conversation at the community and even at the yeah. national level. 
No, no, thank you so much, Silo, for this experience, and Maria, too, because it's very important for the, not, not just for us, but for the public to understand better how EITI is, in a, is in a tool that you can use in your country, if your country is part of the EITI family, and how you can access to information, and how to use, how use this information to make clear uh, advocacy in front of the companies or in even the countries. I don't know, Rafael, is there are questions from the, because I don't want to continue using uh, for, uh, for yes. let's I see don't. if there, let's see if there is, uh, um, if there are some questions, we thank you so much to, to Cielo, to Maria, to Cesar. We could have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. We have two other presentations on two other tools um, for sustainability, transparency, and, and human rights in the sector. Um, but yes, this is the opportunity to ask Cielo and Maria if you have any additional questions. You can do that in the chat. We don't have questions so far in the chat. Anyone would like to come in and ask something to uh, Cielo, Maria, or Cesar? You can raise your hand or just open your mic. Okay, I'm not seeing questions, I think. So, Cesar, uh, final reflections from your side? No, no, no. I think, yeah, the, the time is over. So, thank you so much, Maria and Cielo, for, for being here, for attending this meeting. And thank you so much for, for your experience, your knowledge, and the learning lesson that we can have from EITI work. And I think that it's it's a quite challenge for for civil society continue working on on that uh, in this initiative and I think that at least we we can have a balance uh, in a positive way to to get some results like an environmental issue for example and we hope that in the future include the free program for consultation as a standard in the ITI process. Thank you so much, Cielo Maria. Thanks Thank so much you. to everyone. Big applause uh, for you um, and. Um, Thanks for your inputs. So um, we're gonna have two other presentations and then the second part of the meeting, we're gonna dedicate to discussing how to use all this. So we've now heard about EITI as a mechanism for transparency, for dialogue between different actors with its pros and its cons. I think that has been really important as well. Um, and we're gonna move on to a second issue and a second theme, which is the Escasu Treaty which is going to be presented by uh, Thomas Severino. So you, you might have heard about this process going on in the Americas region. Um, Thomas is going to say more about this, so I won't. He's the representative of the public for the regional public mechanism of the Escazú Agreement and director of the civil association Cultura Ecológica. Uh, has a degree in international relations from the Universidad Autónoma de Centro America. Um, and a postgraduate degree also at the UNAM. Um, and he worked at, uh, has been in charge of Cultura Ecologica since uh, 1999. Um, so, uh, Thomas, uh, thank you so much for your presence and time. We're handing it over to you and please tell us a little bit about how the Escazú Treaty can be useful for the work uh, in Guyana and in the sector more, more broadly. You have uh, about 15 minutes to do this. If Thank people have so questions for Thomas, please write them down in the chat uh, straight away. Thank you so much, uh, Rafael. And um, thank you uh, to the organizers of this workshop and for the invitation and, and the possibility of being able to, to participate and to uh, share and learn about the Gaia process and, 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 and many other process related to, to the 80. And so it's, uh, it's very nice to be here. And especially thank you to Dar and Cesar and Aida. Um, so to start with, yes, my name is Tomas Severino. I, I, I have been working on environmental issues, particularly on Principle 10 uh, for many years now. And I've been working with many coalitions or, or organizations around the, the region. And I had the opportunity to participate along with many other people in the Escazú agreement process since its very beginning. So that's why, um, and, and I also uh, know the, the AT process in, from, from uh, EITI process in, from, uh, from the Mexican experience a little bit. So uh, I'm gonna try to, to explain uh, uh, quickly what is the SCASU agreement and the status of this, what are the countries that are part of it now and uh, how can you, how can the SCASU agreement and the, the extractive initiative can be um, um, 
well, must be put together in synergies to, to uh, produce more benefits for everyone. So just a quick background. And on March uh, the 4th in uh, 2018, after uh, six years of uh, uh, negotiation process, uh, which was uh, which started at the Rio conference, uh, Rio Plus Twenty, in uh, 2012. Um, there, the countries, ten countries, um, lead, led by by uh, Chile and Costa Rica, uh, launched the initiative or on a regional discussion on a regional instrument, somehow uh, similar to the European one, the Aarhus Convention, but uh, uh, made specifically for our region. And so the process started that very same year after the Rio Plus 20 conference in Santiago. And it, it had six years, but the first two years were to coordinate and to plan and to set the basis uh, 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 to, uh, on, on which the, the negotiations were, were going to be. Who, were, who was going to participate? How, how, how often would they meet um, and what would be the participation of the regional public? Because this initiative was also uh, from its very beginning uh, was uh, pushed by the civil society along the region. So uh, we were there from the, from the beginning and the, 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 this, um, um, this uh, fir first two, two years of the planning the process came out with a document called modalities for the public participation. Instead of calling us civil society or major groups, the decision was to, to, to be as wide as possible and to call the civil society the public. So the public was very involved. There, there was all, you can also now can go to the website of the secretariat at the ECLAC, ECLAC website, and you can register uh, as part of the regional, regional public mechanism. And there you get to, uh, to access information and emails and uh, news about the process. Anyway, so, uh, and then uh, in 2015, the, the, the second part of the process started, which was the negotiation process of the agreement, uh, which took four years uh, that ended up in, 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 in March uh, 2018 in, in the municipality of Escazú in San Jose, Costa Rica. Um, so, and, and, and this is very important because it's, it's the very first regional treaty that we, as a region, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, built for ourselves based on our difference, yes, our differences, but also based on our common needs and, uh, and our common problems. And, uh, and because we basically share more than the same uh, context, we are rich in natural resources, but poor on governments, uh, institutions, and rich also in exploitation and extractive processes in, in of our uh, natural resources. Anyway, so, uh, but what we never had done a, a treaty, a regional treaty before or else, it, uh, or it's the first time for us. And it's also the first time that we have a, an environmental human rights treaty that is legally binding. That's also very important. And um, so this, and, and, and I'm, I'm happy to say that Guyana, by the way, was the first country to ratify the Escazú Agreement uh, in, in, in the year of uh, 2019. And so uh, it's, it's, it's good to be able to say that. Anyway, uh, so the, the last April, uh, the day of uh, Mother Earth, the International Day of Mother Earth, the treaty came into force officially within the 12 countries that uh, uh, had ratified it, which are, uh, well, you see Mexico, Guyana, San Lucia, Argentina, Bolivia, Uruguay, San Vincent and the Granadines, Antigua and Barbuda, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Panama, and Kits and Nevis. We still have a lot of uh, are to and to join. And um, so uh, a lot of work to be done. But anyway, so here's a, a, in a more graphic way the, the, the status of the agreement in the region. So you have uh, uh, the countries that have ratified, and, and then the top, the countries that have just signed but not ratified countries that are in the process of uh, ratification, such as Colombia and Costa Rica, and hopefully Peru with the new, um, with the new uh, Congress that's come out of the new, the, this electoral process that just went down last week or so. 
and uh, so and we still have a lot to to do in terms of some part of the Caribbean and some part of the uh, Central America. So that's basically the status. And there, there's so so it's it's already in force for the twelve countries, but it's also started an, a, a countdown process for its first conference of the parties, which will happen in the first uh, uh, months of the coming year, the next year, 2022. Um, okay, so we said it's legally binding. It's, it, it's a, human rights, a human rights approach treaty, which is, it makes a, a difference because at least, I don't know in Guyana, but at least in Mexico, uh, we are uh, used to the regular uh, the, or the usual environmental um, uh, treaties, but that, that are just environmental, not human right related. And so this is, makes it broader and, and, and wider, and it's, it, it's, it gives us a much bigger, let's say, a much bigger umbrella to, to, to build on the, uh, on the, for, its, uh, for, for, for countries to comply with the agreement. And um, it's also the first instrument, not only in the region, but around the world. And this is no joke, and this is very important and serious, and, and we should be glad but still very sad. This is the first uh, instrument in its kind that has a guarantee to protect the environmental defenders and the, organi and the organizations that, are, that, that work on uh, human rights on environmental matters. And, and especially in a region, as you know, that the, our region is the most dangerous region in the world to exercise the, 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 uh, uh, the, the demanding or promotion of human rights on environmental matters. Though, so this is very important. Uh, it also has a definition on groups on vulnerable situations, which uh, we didn't have one before in any other official international document. And so the most important thing is that the Escazú agreement sets the, the, the floor, so to speak, not the ceiling. So nothing uh, be, uh, below the, the Escazú agreement but the uh, above ev everything. So it uh, sets the standards on access to information uh, on how to guarantee the access to information rights for the people, the access to participation in the decision-making on environmental processes and the justice in environmental matters. And, and so it, it's, it's I, would, I, I would like to say the expression that Escazú is like a mirror uh, now, even if we have not ratified or, or even sign, it's a, it's a little mirror in which we can see our constitution, our environmental laws, our uh, regulations, but also our uh, public policies, uh, and also uh, the public policies on the, on the short term, like the operational year programs or the licensing or the, participa or the participation processes for uh, water discussions or forest discussions. So Escazú is a mirror in which we can see how open uh, or how um, um, standards, uh, Escazú standards related are our, our policies, laws and regulations, and that's important too. And, uh, and also uh, Escazú uh, decided not to, to have only three pillars, access to information, access to justice, or access to participation, but also uh, two other more pillars, cooperation and capacity building, which are as important as this uh, other rights, for the countries to be able to implement the agreement and to actually uh, <clears throat> strengthen their national capacities for, for, for these rights to be uh, guaranteed. Okay, um, so what about Escazú and the uh, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative? Um, we already had in, 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 the, in the standards, the 6.1 social and environmental expenditures by extractive companies which already was difficult to implement, to follow up because there was no much information. Uh, um, um, at least I remember in the case of Mexico and other countries, this is not something that is already uh, going on smoothly, but we already had some, some of it. But the important thing is this uh, new uh, start of uh, 2019, which in includes uh, and incorporates a long time standing civil society demand on, on, on for, for the standard to include the impact of um, environmental impact of, of, and so the, of, of the um, extractive industries. So it finally happened. And in the meeting in Paris in, in 19, 20, uh, 19, um, 2019, uh, 
uh, we have now the new 6.4 environmental impact of the extractive in, uh, uh, activities. And we have, for example, I'm not gonna go deep into detail, but environmental impact assessment, certification schemes, licenses and, and rights guarantees on uh, uh, oil, gas and mining companies, the roles and responsibilities of relevant uh, 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 government, uh, government agencies or, or, or what we call in Escazú, the competent authorities and also information on regular environmental monitoring procedures and administrative and sanctioning processes of governments, as well as environmental liabilities uh, and, 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 and or environmental rehabilitation and remediation. So this is, uh, we know it's not enough, but it's good enough to get a good start on uh, facing the other side, the environmental and social impacts of the extractives, not only by uh, reflecting how much do they pay, where and how to the countries in which they uh, uh, extract <laughs> the resources, but also about the consequences and the damages and the possibility of uh, using our very old national laws to, to um, support and, 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 and um, help the, the companies to, to, to comply with this new 6.4 standard. And this is why Escazú, and, and this, is my, this is where Escazú and the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative uh, may come together. Specifically, yes, the Article 6 of the Escazú Agreement, which uh, uh, sets uh, the general terms for the dissemination and generation of environmental information, but you already know that because you in Guyana, you have the Freedom of Information Act, and it's also in the constitution, as well as the right to a healthy environment, healthy in, the ter in terms of health as well, and which is very interesting. And so, but, but particularly I'd like to refer to you, and I uh, invite you to read and to search on the, on the agreement, the 6.3 article, uh, which uh, goes uh, more into detail with what the 6.4 in, in, uh, in the uh, EITI uh, uh, standard uh, relates to. And uh, we have environmental laws and regulations. So the obligation of the, 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 the authorities to put in place uh, environmental laws, regulations and administrative acts, a, a list of public entities competent in environmental matters or, or as they call it in the, in the other standard, uh, the, 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 the public uh, the related public authorities, a, a list of polluted areas by type of pollution and location, and, uh, and many more information, but also uh, environmental information on environmental impact assessments and, and, and the related processes, environmental management instruments, are uh, licenses, permits granted by the authorities, uh, or such as, uh, or, or, or also a list of wastes. Uh, by type or volume or location or by year, where, where, whenever it's possible, and the uh, imposition of administrative sanctions in environmental matters. So, uh, what Escazú and the, the, the standard are Thomas, bound well, to work minutes. together. Sorry? You have five minutes to wrap up, please. Yes, great. Uh, so, uh, just by setting these two examples on, on a quick uh, and a uh, review of the 6.4 of the uh, EITI and the 6.3 of the Escazú Agreement. Um, so the match is, is, is not only necessary, but uh, uh, possible. And, 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 and we, we can use both uh, or, or see these uh, this, this instruments, the, the, um, the standard and the Escazú Agreement. We can see from wherever we are standing, we may help get help from the other. Uh, we, we, uh, Escazú helps the 6.4 implementation and, by, and the other way for implementing 6.4 or, or uh, uh, we need the 6.3 in Escazú. So they're bound to go together. We need to work on the synergies and there are some other uh, uh, synergies that we can join as well, uh, especially countries that have ratified, are, are part of both as Guyana and Mexico and the, and uh, uh, there's uh, the Sustainable Development Goals agenda, which we are, are uh, eight and a half years left to, to, to have all the um, 
support, political support from the governments and local authorities on the agenda that can be combined with the uh, extractive industry standards and with Escazú. And also there's this um, open government partnership uh, initiative, which uh, uh, was born in uh, 2011, and it started also with eight countries, and now it has 7,500 countries, 17 in Latin America and the Caribbean. And there's also the possibility of modifying or improving or creating some public policies and also around this CASU or the extractive industries or the in turn general terms, uh, environmental information. Uh, uh, also, uh, so we need to, to uh, take advantage of this moment in which all these um, um, processes and the, at the international level are driven more or less by the same principles, but they also have the political support of governments at the national level and at the regional level. And I don't recall in the last 20 years or 25 years, a, a, an alignment, if may I say so, of such international initiatives that have relevance, that have support, and that have uh, the national, uh, um, the, the, the national uh, uh, interests of our governments uh, through different administrations. So I think we are in a very good moment to strengthen uh, each each, uh, each of these uh, uh, synergies and to work on and on, on all together uh, to 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 have a better uh, regulations and better uh, compliance and uh, more benefits in the long run for the people that are being affected and in the general sense for environmental governments and for the natural resources and the health and uh, the health of our communities and uh, strengthening the rights of those people that are now under very vulnerable circumstances, such as the pandemic has shown in our region, particularly in the Amazon and the countries that are, are involved in the, in, the, in the Amazonic basin. Uh, so uh, we need Escazú uh, for uh, the, the building up after the pandemic, because uh, states have shown that the first thing they sacrifice when there's a pandemic is human rights. Uh, they close the information uh, access to information offices, they stop the public participation processes and the, tri and the tribunals and courts went very slow, but did, that didn't happen for all of us, that didn't happen for the mining or the oiling industries, so we need to, the comeback after the pandemic needs, need to be, it needs to be hand to hand with the Escazú agreement. And that's why I was saying at the beginning that Escazú is like a mirror in which we can see how uh, well or bad, or the, 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 the spaces for improvement, the windows of opportunity for improvement in our policies, regulations, uh, and, and laws. And so I would leave it there and open for any uh, conversation. And again, my, I'm very happy to, to be part of this issue. And, and, and I congratulate uh, Guyana uh, for uh, all the efforts. And we are here to help and, and to discuss if any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. I think it was a very complete and interesting uh, presentation. Um, we have opened the chat for questions, uh, but if somebody would like to ask a question, uh, pre um, putting on the camera and just asking the question, that's that's perfect as well. Um, so please take advantage, advantage of this moment to ask what you would like to ask Thomas, writing it down in the chat or asking for the table. In the chat, we have a question of uh, Simone. Do, would you like to uh, answer the question yourself? If not, then the question I, is what measures, are, the questions. Yeah, what uh, measures are in place for monitoring the undertakings of governments that have signed the agreements uh, from Simone. And Jerry um, okay asks if a government does not follow provisions of the Escazú agreement uh, pertaining to release of information, for example, what can a citizen or group do? Can there be complaints to the Escazú secretariat? As is, Guyana has EPA laws, but government had not initially imposed fines for flaring, and when it did, it was half what the company would have had to pay in the USA. Well, at least they paid something. We don't have that much here. <laughs> no, uh, that, that, that kind of questions about um, 
uh, compliance are the things that are um, now being asked the, the most in, in, in this uh, different for Yes, we don't know yet. I mean, we are working on it, I rather say. This for the first conference of the parties, which will happen, as I said, uh, the early uh, the first months of the next year, we are working on three issues that need to be uh, voted or agreed on in the first conference of the party. Um, then the financing, uh, uh, we as the public would like to, to, to um, push that some of that money would be used to help people to participate in the conferences. That's one. And then uh, in a general sense, the, the other one is the, the rules of procedure uh, on, on who, who's gonna be able to participate, where are the meetings and how often would they take place and no, and, and uh, but the most uh, uh, the most difficult one is the uh, facil uh, compliance committee of the agreement. This that is what is the what, the institution, the mechanism the, the, that the governments will give themselves to actually monitor uh, the advances on the implementing the agreement. Now, this is an agreement that does not uh, be fulfilled or can be measured in terms of. Uh, um, um, CO2 uh, carbon to, uh, tons uh, reduced or contained, no? This is about rights. And so the first thing is, are we um, complying with our own national laws? And if not, and then we can see where do we need to improve those laws to be able to comply with this CASU standard? So it's not a thing that immediately stands for, do you comply or not this CASU agreement? At first, how ha, have you done enough at the internal level to strengthen your uh, legal and institutional framework to, compl to comply with the agreement? That's the first thing. Before we actually try to, to see whether we can not, uh, whether our country or our government is doing well or not in the agreement, we first we have to start by reviewing the national uh, legal and regulations and public policies frameworks. That's, and, and then we can try to, uh, uh, in the meantime, we, we're, we, we are going to fight, so to speak, uh, at the regional level for the conference of the party and the committee to have some space for civil society to uh, uh, raise their hand or their voice saying uh, that some governments are violating or particularly going uh, against the principles of the agreement. Yes, we're gonna to try to do so, but the first uh, word has to be done at our own, <laughs> our own countries. And we need to create uh, observatories or monitoring institutions broad with the participation of the academy, civil society, uh, um, community-based groups, uh, and on also the powers. And I, I recommend to see the example that's being said by Ecuador. Ecuador in the Open Government Partnership has set a, a roadmap to implement Escazú in the country. And that is to do a, a, an analysis of legal congruency with the agreement of the main laws in Ecuador. And then a, a, to develop a plan to, um, to uh, work on, the, on those issues that need to be uh, reviewed or, or updated in the laws, and then a committee to do a follow-up on the recommendations that came out of a plan. So there are chances to do so, and at the local level, Escazú also sets uh, um, 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 obligations for the governments to, to proceed. So we can start local, and, and we can go further, and, but we need to do a lot of uh, work at the national level to improve and, and, uh, and force governments to comply with the laws that are already existing that already exist and to create new ones and to, um, yeah, that's my answer so far. Great, thank you, Thomas. Anyone else would like to ask a question for Thomas? We still have a few minutes on this issue. Who would like to react on what you just explained? So we have we have just heard or I have just heard about the um Escasu agreement and we know there is much talk about open government. Um much of the civil society organizations that I am networked with um do not feel we need to have we are a match for um the government and 
any match for pushing to get the type of information um, that ought to be available to the public, to the public. Uh, we have learned um, over the course of the week for those who have been on this platform and for some of the people, the locals on this call um, in our own media and what has been happening, particularly um, as we talking about the extraction of oil more specifically, which has opened our eyes more to the other um, nuances and things that ought to be addressed in our pre-existing um, extractive industries. But the fact is, because we feel so limited in our ability to, um, to hold accountable, to bring the fire to those who ought to be doing much of the things that they have signed on to, we're just not able to do it, which is a disadvantage. It's not that we are not aware of what we would like to have and to see, but it's just not happening. So I just wanted to state that. Thank you. Thomas, would you like to oh, respond I mean, I, to that I, I, I comment? couldn't agree more. I mean, we, we it's not, it, this is not, not, either of the initiatives are not a, 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 a magic wound, you know? So, so now we sign, now we're better and we can, uh, no, 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 no. It's going to take. No, it's. It, that's what I said. It's. It's a bigger umbrella in which we can rely and uh, try to unite efforts and agendas. But it's going to take a long time. If we, if, if we have the uh, EITI, is because the extractives are very obscure and don't want to share information. And if we, if we need a human rights treaty to guarantee the access to information, participation, and justice rights, is because our governments are not being open or are not being open enough to give us access to those rights. It's because we are against the, 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 the mainstream. That's what I'm trying to say. And so, but Escazú will set, is setting the, the, the basis for some of these problems to be, um, to, to have remedy in the midterm uh, because it, it has to be progressive, uh, but, but, but countries can no go can cannot go back. They can always move forward slowly, but forward. It, it, that's the principle of uh, progressive, no progressiveness. So, uh, um, and and we need to understand that with this human rights uh, approach, we can gen have instruments in the midterm uh, to 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 approach the tribunals in a different way. And, and to approach the administrative uh, authorities in charge of generating information in a different way. And, 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 and to understand that this is not just to, to fulfill a social demand, a public demand, this is to fulfill a, a need also for the governments. They, they will benefit from uh, generating, updating and sharing information with their own agencies and with their own local governments. And, and, and so, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the companies, the private companies may uh, after a while understand that Escazú is not, or AITI is not against them, but it could be their ally. And if done well, it can even be more profitable than the, the, the usual the, uh, way of doing, the usual business way of doing things. But uh, so but we need time and we need to convince people and we need to understand that we need to dialogue and, and to, to, to get as many people and institutions on board and we can go all together. I know that the, the urgency and the violations to human rights are happening right now as we speak. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm not so uh, uh, innocent. I'm just saying that if we want this to work, we need to, I mean, EITI has been around for 20 years almost, no? Uh, and the Escazú Agreement also for, tw to, for I don't know, eight, eight years. And, but we need to, to, to keep on working together and, and slowly. <laughs> In that sense, there's a last question, which I think is interesting because Jerry uh, Jailal, Asked, asked if, uh, is, if Escazú is legally binding on governments, but AT is not, will Escazú then be able to accomplish what AT cannot? And there comes the second question. Uh, governments use AT and Escazú as allies. 
they say we are party of all these transparency organizations, so we must be a good government. We are not violators. So they use it also to uh, as an image uh, thing. Yeah, so maybe we can reflect as a uh, last comment on this on these two questions. I'm, I'm not sure. How, no, not sure. I don't know at all how how this works in Guyana, but for in, in Mexico we are not used to 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 demand human rights and environment yet. We even had um, a constitutional modification in 19, uh, in 12, um, 2011 to state that uh, international treaties were the supreme law. And if they were about human rights, they were very much the supreme law. And so very much at the level of the constitution, but still we're not used to it yet. And I think that 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 is a difference that we need uh, uh, we need to change our chip as environmentalists, particularly myself and the group I work with, and 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 to understand that we need to to change the view from the environmental to the human rights, which makes it bigger, wider, and you can bring in more people and arguments to courts and to administrative decisions. I think that's the key element that. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a, a thing that we need to understand and to process and, and, and then to push it into public policies and law reforms. Okay, very, thank you very much, Thomas. I think this is, it's been very interesting. Um, and after the break in the, in the groups, we will reflect a bit more on how useful this can be for, for the different contexts where you're all working in. But before that, we have uh, one more presentation um, from Daniel Sequeira. Thank you for being here with us, Daniel. Um, Daniel is a Brazilian lawyer who works in the Due Process of Law Foundation in the program of human rights and natural resources. He's in charge of research, advocacy, diffusion of information on human rights impacts caused by extractive and infrastructure mega projects and the international responsibility of the states involved in them. He also has worked as a lawyer in the uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, with a special rapporteurship for freedom of expression in the protection group um, and in the section of uh, in charge of the cases and monitoring the human rights situation in Bolivia and Peru. Um, and he's been also part of the team that provides uh, technical advice to the members uh, of the commission in the processes of modifying its rules of procedure, polit policies and institutional practices. So a lot of experience that he's bringing into this table. And on this occasion, he will share his knowledge on indigenous rights uh, and especially the, I, uh, specifically the ILO agreement uh, 169, the UN declaration on indigenous rights, and also how to conduct these prior consultation processes, what uh, protocols and exper experiences uh, there are to share. So thank you very much, Daniel, for being here with us. Uh, I will give you the, the word now. Uh, if you want to present, you can present uh, uh, your PowerPoint or something else. And you will have uh, about 15 minutes, and then we will have five or a bit more minutes to, to talk about your presentation. Thank you uh, very much. It's a pleasure to join you uh, this afternoon, but it's still morning for me. Um, I'm talking from Washington, D.C., uh, where DPLF is based, my organization. I'm going to share my screen just to be sure that everything is working well. So I'd like to thank the PADF and also DAR for inviting me. In the next few minutes, I will talk a little bit about the international human rights standards regarding indigenous peoples and tribal rights, mostly related to free private and informed consultation and consent, which is one of the most important rights of those collective groups. Um, my organization has the mandate to try to strengthen uh, the democracy and the rule of law in Latin America and the Caribbean through the use of the international human rights standards. And I coordinate a program that seeks to um, implement this mandate in what is related to uh, the impacts of natural resource extraction in human rights overall, but mostly for rural and indigenous communities. Uh, when we talk about free prior and informal consultation and consent, uh, in the next uh, uh, minutes, I will talk about FPIC, which is the, the acronym of this, right? We are actually uh, employing a term that is a consensus, a regional, national, and global consensus 
that is uh, used by private and public actors uh, throughout the world. Uh, here are just a few examples of how spread out is this um, term uh, employed uh, in Africa, in Latin America, and also in South Asia. Um, and in Europe, some countries has actually ratified the ILO convention, the International Organ uh, Labor Organization Convention uh, 169, I will talk a little bit about it in the next few uh, slides. Uh, what we mean by free private informed consent, it's free uh, when there is no manipulation of coercion against indigenous communities. It's prior when it's uh, performed before any decision taken by the state that can affect indigenous people's rights. And it is informed when it facilitates uh, objective and accurately uh, the understandable information involved in any uh, state decision, mostly uh, extractive projects that can affect their territories. And there is consent when it allows community to approve or reject uh, the project uh, uh, concerned. The most important instrument in the international sphere that uh, enshrined this right is the International Labor Organization 169. Article six of this instrument uh, spell out mostly, uh, most of the, the content of the state's obligation with regard to, to FPIC. As you can see, any potential, uh, of, uh, whenever there is a potential impact on indigenous people's rights, specific, especially with regard to their territories, uh, states should uh, consult through uh, these requirements, it should be free, prior, and informed. Um, and who are the subject of these rights? Uh, international law uh, speaks about two uh, collective groups, indigenous peoples and tribal peoples. Tribal peoples are not the are, are the ones that are not indigenous to a given territory. It means indigenous means that it existed before the colonization process, and tribal groups is is more related to uh, a specific group that keeps a um, traditional use of a land or keep a specific cultural institution uh, that existed even before uh, the current borders of the states, mostly in the American context. In Africa, it's a little bit more confusing, but I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the American context. And there are two main um, criteria to define when we are in front of a tribal or indigenous group. One of them is objective, as you see in, in Article 1 of ILO Convention. It means that th this group keep certain political and cultural institutions. And the most important one, or in the second one, is the subjective, is when the collective group identify themselves as indigenous or tribal. So that's the one that is the most important according to the international standards. Here are the countries that has ratified uh, the ILO conventions. 24, uh, 14 out of them are come from the Latin American or the Caribbean. I think that's only Dominica is from is a Caribbean country that has ratified the ILO convention 169. Guyana has not ratified so far, but the ILO convention 169 basically enshrine international standards that's also mirrored in the UN Declaration on Indigenous People's Rights, an instrument that is from 2007, adopted by the UN General Assembly. And the, it, this instrument, uh, I will talk a little bit about it in the next few slides, basically enshrines the international standard that's applicable overall, including with regards to Guyana. The normative source of the FP obligations is not only based on the ILO Convention 169, also the UN Declaration of 2007, and also the pronouncements or precedents of the international human rights bodies, such as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and also the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, but also the human rights bodies of the UN uh, level or the UN system. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights specifically has said that these obligations, the FP, is not only um, um, linked to the ILO Convention 169, it says specifically that it also derives from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and also the International Co Covenant on uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which has been ratified by Guana and Guyana and most of the UN member states. There are very few ones that has not ratified the ICCP, that's International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So it's a binding obligation also with regard to Guyana and other Caribbean states that has not ratified the ILO convention. And here is the most important uh, articles of the UN declaration of 2007. It uh, moves a little bit further with comparison to the ILO convention 169. The, this ILO convention is from 1989, 
and the UN declarations from 2007. If you read both documents, you see that the UN declaration focused a little bit more on the consent, more than consultation. According to the declaration, any consultation process should seek the consent of the involved community, which means the right to veto a specific project when they are, do not agree with them. Uh, in some specific cases, it, the, the, the consent should not only be sought, but also it's a mandatory obligation of the states whenever there is a risk of forced displacement, for instance, of indigenous group or a tribal group. So in those cases, for instance, large scale projects that will basically mean the forced displacement of those groups, they have the, the right to say, I don't want this project. It's very important to take that into consideration. In the private sector, the consultation and consent is also, I would say, a standard uh, terminology or a standard obligation that several companies uh, have committed to, to fulfill or to observe. Here, here you have just a, a few samples of them. It's a chart from a publication published by Oxfam in 2015. It's an index of the most important companies, mostly in the uh, extractive sector, oil and gas, and also a mining sector that commit themselves uh, with regard to consultation and consent. As you see also some consul uh, organizations such as I ICMM, the International Council on Mining and Metals, some international banks or, or, or multilateral banks such as uh, IFC, which is the private branch of the World, uh, World Bank Group. And also the IDB, the Inter-American Inter Development Bank has adopted some safeguards that acknowledge the FPIC as a common standard. And here is also a, um, a chart from this Oxfam publication from 2015. It's a way, uh, uh, I would say, faded. It's not updated uh, uh, at all because six years after this publication was published, I can say that most of the, the biggest mining companies in the world and also oil and gas companies commit themselves to FPIC as a standard obligation in their operations uh, worldwide. A very important publication, um, that was issued uh, and elaborated by Professor uh, Bambington, uh, who is now uh, advisor at Ford Foundation, uh, explained what's the economic cost of non consulting uh, local, mostly indigenous groups. And when they stand, they basically uh, create social conflicts. It's much more costly to not consult than to consult properly according to the international standards. Bambington gives us several examples of a specific projects in which. Uh, some operations were, were halted due to the social conflicts uh, that were related to the lack of consultation and just a very, I would say, a serious survey on how costly can be a mining or, for instance, uh, oil project uh, that does not fulfill the international standards on consultation and consent. So try to move a little bit faster. Um, so I'll, I'll now enter a little bit more on the specific state's obligations with regard to this right. Here is a publication made by ICAR. It's a, a, um, a counter table uh, organization based in, in DC, but they basically cover several NGOs and other actors throughout the world. So in these publications, my organization and ICAR basically try to summarize what are the most important um, standard that should be taken into consideration at the elaboration of the national action plans, specifically on the section on extractive industries. Uh, national action plans is basically a, a, a document in which states explain to the stakeholders what are the, the, the human rights standards applied to any business activity in a given country. Uh, Peru uh, approved its, the government of Peru approved its national action plan uh, yesterday in the midst of the turmoil, political and social turmoil. Don't want to spend time on that because we have a lot of Peruvians here at the room. But uh, it's a very important document in which a state commit themselves to several obligations and explain what's the legal standards of their own country with regards to the international standards. So in this case, we recommend a, a lot of actions that should be done, should be taken into consideration by states adopting its national action plans or NET. I'm not sure what's the stage of the NEP discussion in Guyana. I can assume that there is some uh, pressures from other, uh, even companies um, that operate in Guyana to work under a more clear uh, institutionality and the NEPs can be a very good a, a way of implementing those clarity for any uh, private and also uh, home states 
countries involved in, in investments in Guyana. So I don't have time to, to, to explain uh, in, in depth the content of this document is all in our webpage. If you, there is anyone uh, interested, uh, I can also share the link. It's also available in our webpage. This is another publication available in our webpage. It's a, basically a summary of a very important report of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights that was published in December 2015. We, and it deals with the uh, state obligations to tribal and indigenous peoples. The Inter-American Commission here says African descendants communities, but basically African descendants that have a tribal nature uh, and also indigenous communities in the context of extractive uh, industries. Uh, this document explains the most uh, common rights impacted by extractive activities and also provides very important uh, definitions uh, on the um, uh, environmental uh, sphere, such as ecosystem, biodiversity. And um, it also spells out the, the, the most concrete obligations uh, of home states and also uh, the states where the operations are taking place which is known as the whole state, which is a very interesting thing to take into account because civil society organizations in Guyana, for example, for, for instance, they can um, not only uh, request its own state to fulfill those obligations, but also, for instance, to Canada to take into consideration the international standards applied to Canada with regards to Canadian companies operating in Guyana. That's, uh, I would say, one of the most uh, important developments of international human rights bodies in the past few years that also uh, brings attention of what should the home states of companies operating abroad should do to avoid those companies to basically violate human rights abroad. It's a way of avoiding the externalization of environmental and human rights costs of multinational, multinational uh, companies operating in, in other countries. Two more uh, minutes, please, uh, Daniel. Two more, oh, I should go faster. Uh, so you have also access to this uh, document in our webpage. I just want to, 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 to spend a few seconds on the last chart that you see large scale projects and consent requirements. This document gives a much more detailed definition of when states should not only seek consent, but commit itself to respect the less voice of the indigenous groups. Whenever there is a large scale project that can affect the rights of indigenous groups, the consent is mandatory, not, not only something that the state should, should seek. Uh, very important to make a difference between ethnic and general obligation to consult the population uh, in a broader way. I, as a citizen in, in Washington, D.C., uh, here in the United States, I have a right to be consulted before anything that happens in my neighborhood, for instance. They will install a large-scale product, project in my instance. I have the right to know what's going on but an indigenous group that has a much more stringent right, which is FP. So it's not the same thing to, to talk about uh, citizen participation or transparency and FP. FP is a much more stringent obligation applied only to indigenous and tribal groups. Here is a brief of uh, advisory opinion of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, also available in our webpage in four languages. English was one of them. And here you have some procedural obligations that's applicable besides indigenous people's group to any citizens. But once again, the Inter-American Court has made a difference between FPIC and the obligation to uh, the, what is known as procedural obligations before any potential uh, environmental damage. And lastly, this, doc this document is also available in our webpage. It was uh, published along with Oxfam. And here we address basically the most common problems of implementing the FPIC obligations in Latin America, six, country, six, six countries of Latin America. And we have several examples that try to apply the general international and constitutional standards to situations in, in which, for instance, a government or a, 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 a civil servant do not uh, uh, respect those standards. It's a much more, I would say, operative document that can also be of interest of Guyana civil society, mostly, I would say, the Guyana uh, uh, administrative bodies. So I will stay here and I, I, I'm sorry, I just uh, had a, one additional minute in my, in, my, in my presentations. I'm more than happy to address other topics through the comments and eventual questions we may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. So again, uh, the chat and also the floor is open to, to questions. Um, if you would like to ask your question through the chat, you can do that. And if you would like to just ask it, just uh, put on your camera and 
and ask the question, please. Simone made a comment in the chat more uh, than a question. And she says, this morning's meeting has been very informative thus far. And it will take a lot from civil society in Guyana to organize and educate their audiences on the various paths to keeping government open and transparent. Uh, Frederick, you have lifted your hand. You have raised your hand. Yes. Uh, good oh, morning yeah. and thank you, Mr. Sekeira, for your uh, presentation. Um, I noticed that you indicated that Brazil is a member of ILO 169, if I have the digits right, but you know what I'm talking about. And um, those of us who are old enough would know that the history of the fight for indigenous rights in Brazil is long. Uh, the name Chico Mendes comes to mind. But um, we noticed that there seems to be an unraveling of late of all the gains, including the weakening of um, uh, organizations like FUNAI that um, Brazil has constructed over the years to secure the rights of indigenous people. So my question is, what? how do you assess the membership of Brazil, a, 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 a strong player like Brazil in, in world events and um, with its history and having set up such structures? Um, how, what is happening in terms of the Bolsonaro effect to dismantle all of this in view of what you have said? Is it that um, like Mexico, what, what we just heard, in spite of all the legalities, the culture just refuses to comply? What is happening? Could you explain, please? Should I go ahead and try to answer this one? Okay. Oh, yeah, go you. ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick. Uh, it's very, um, I'll say, uh, important question for me as Brazilian. Even though I live abroad uh, since 2006, I work a lot with indigenous organizations in Brazil, and we are kind of concerned about the possibility of the Congress of Brazil to approve a bill authorizing Bolsonaro to basically um, lift the ILO Convention 169. I, to be straightforward, I assume there will be a huge diplomatic impact if Brazil uh, does so. Uh, the very last country that ratified the ILO Convention 169 was Germany a, a few weeks ago. Norway is also a member of ILO Convention 169. Why would Germany ratify a, an instrument with there is no indigenous groups in Germany? In Norway, there is. There is Inuit, there are several ones actually, um, mostly in the northern the part of, of the state. But why would Germany do so? Basically because it's a common sense that the best way or eventually the best way, not one of the best, the best way of securing environmental protection is securing indigenous people's rights because they have a, this specificity of protecting their environment and their way of life. And in this means a very good policy of combating climate change. Um, if Brazil does uh, uh, denounce the ILO Convention 169, I think there will be a huge uh, pushback with regards to the Brazilian relationship with Norway, Germany, and other countries, including countries that are not party to the ILO Convention 169. The United States has not even signed the ILO Convention, neither ratified, but I'm pretty sure that the diplomatic relations between Brazil and the United States will, or the United States will address somehow in its diplomatic relations to Brazil, this possibility. Right now, we are actually involved in several initiatives to enhance the political cost of the announcement of the ILO 69. But the discourse, the political discourse of my government, of Jair Bolsonaro, is basically dealing with those kind of international obligations as a, a hindrance to the Brazilian development. Uh, the, I would say that the counter, um, or, or the alternative way of, of, of looking to this is that even private companies operating in Brazil will be concerned if Brazil take a more aggressive steps and announce very important instruments such as ILO uh, 169 convention. So I also invite everyone here in this room and to try to be attentive and try to, to monitor what's going on in Brazil. We, if we are in the verge of having Brazil to denounce the convention 169, very few countries has even tried to start this debate. Chile was one, but it basically faded away very quickly. So we, if, if we are on the verge, I will also count on your solidarity and try to to raise our voice to avoid that to happen. Thank you, Daniel. 
very important comments. Uh, there's a question coming up here. Um, Jerry asked, uh, you said Guayana is not ratified, ILO 169. That's because our government has substituted that with lots of solar panels, four-wheeler vehicles and hampers. We tend to take a handouts approach versus a human rights approach. Should uh, Guayana ratify the ILO 169? I, I'm not very familiarized with the Guyana, um, I would say exceptionalism towards international human rights uh, commitments, but it's a common, I would say, tradition of those countries that have a common law tradition. Canada, most of the English speaking Caribbean has not ratified the, not only the ILO 69, but also the most important human rights treaties and covenants of the inter human rights system, for instance. It does not mean that the Guyana's tribunals and even legislators do not take into account the international human rights standards, but something related somehow to this tradition of common law tradition countries uh, to basically avoid the commitments to uh, international human rights uh, obligations. It's a little bit different with, if you compare it to the United States, which is a very federalist state in which it's hard to impose to the federal governments to impose human rights, international human rights obligations to the local states. But I assume also that the, 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 the fact that Guyana has not ratified the ILO 169, the American Convention on Human Rights and other treaties is somehow linked to, to this exceptionalism of this legal and political tradition. But definitely I do believe that Guyana should ratify a law convention 169 for the benefits of its own indigenous populations. Thank you. We have one more last question from Ozzy Warwick. You have the floor. Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, thanks, very, a very informative um, session so far. Um, as you work from Trinidad and Tobago, I have a, a question. What would you say are really some of the gaps in the international legal framework for regulating multinational enterprise, whether as it relates to um, it, Climate, uh, climate change, or whether it relates to the um, intrusion on ind indigenous persons or, or and other human rights abuses and so on. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rosie. Uh, one of the gaps is actually the, the lack of mandates to enforce any human rights obligations to companies itself, to private actors itself. The human rights, the supranational human rights systems uh, globally and regionally, they operate under uh, the assumption that the states are the actors that commit themselves to human rights obligations. So one of the gaps is this. There is a debate right now on a draft treaty on business and human rights on how to expand human rights obligations towards the companies themselves. I don't see any Northern country, United States, Canada, European, I would say developed countries endorsing this possibility. Uh, since actually the this, this 17th century, the actors on the international sphere, at least under the international, uh, international law, is basically the states. But some of the gaps is also linked to the fact that, that most of the obligations relied on the whole state's obligations towards companies operation, operating in their territories. I think the international community has taken very important steps on addressing what's the home state obligations of this company as well, especially Canada. Several pronouncements of UN bodies and also the Inter-American Commission Human Rights with regard to Canada in the past few years is related to how Canadian companies, mostly on the mining sector, operate abroad, not full complying with the international human rights obligations of Canada. So that's one of the gaps that has been filled somehow in the past few years, but we have still a lot of void room to, to keep filling through, through the, the, this, those, those sort of mechanisms, uh, the international human rights parts. I Thank you, Daniel. Well, we reached the hour for the deserved break. You have a right to have a break, and so do all of us. Um, we thank you very much, Daniel, and also Thomas again for, for the input. I think this will be very useful for the part after the break, which, uh, which you're also invited, Thomas and, and Daniel, to participate, because then we would like to um, invite all the people here to reflect on how this could be useful for the Guayana context and the different contexts where people are participating from. And we will work in small groups for that. But uh, before explaining that in detail, uh, please take your break. We can take it until 12 o'clock exactly, please. Uh, so that we will have a full hour to, to do the working groups and to reflect on the working groups as well. Uh, so please take a coffee, have something to eat, take a walk. 
and we'll see each other in nine minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hello, welcome back, everybody. I think everybody's joining again. Well, I suppose the group work was interesting and I suppose it was not enough time as always with group work where we get to the interesting conversation and then we have to be cut. Uh, but I hope you did manage to, to reflect a bit on, on what we have been listening to this morning and um, to be able to reflect on the um, usefulness no, for the context and organizations that you are working in. I'm going to share the, um, uh, the presentation where you've been working on, and I will ask you uh, each group to present, please. And the first group was still writing down, but maybe they're ready to, to present. Uh, this was Alejandra's group, if I, is that true? No, mine was the next one. Okay. so. This group, um, who would like to present? Group one. Uh, this was uh, my group. Uh, I think uh, Jerry is going to be presenting. Thank you, Mario. Yes. Just for a little background, um, oil is new to Kayada. We celebrated the first year of oil uh, in December 2020. So we're just like a year and a half. So what we liked about EITI it gives us a reg legal and regulatory framework as a foundation to build on. And so for a country like Guyana, we were ill-prepared. Uh, there had not been any strong regulatory framework, uh, not a strong uh, environmental framework, not a strong local content policy. We are now um, developing that. We didn't have a framework for auditing and monitoring. So those are being worked on right now. So something like EITI is gonna give you a good start. The issue is in Guyana, it's part of the Ministry of Natural Resources. And so I understand the head of EITI is being employed on a month to month basis. And so I don't know if that's true, but that's what somebody told me yesterday. And there was a danger in that because if groups go to EITI and said, look, the government is not giving us information. Can you intervene? And so do you see what could happen if you are on a month to month basis and you're going steadily to the ministry to say, we need information? It's very risky for the person um, in that position. So maybe we need to look at that um, arrangement again, see if that's the best way to operate the EITI. Jerry, may I just interrupt for a second? Yeah. Uh, I just want to be clear. There's a difference between the multi-stakeholder group and the National Secretariat. And I think it's important to remember the National Secretariat are employees. Um, yes, they do get paid by the Ministry of Natural Resources, but they are like a secretariat. So the MSG is really the deciding group. They, they decide, they make the decisions they're not paid, they're, they're voluntary, they're comprised of the CSOs and, the, and industry and government, but um, it's the National Secretariat that actually executes the orders that are given by the MSG. So um, I, just, I just wanna point that out. Uh, if, if you're referring to sort of like conflict of interest, they're really, it's, they're a secretariat. Yeah. Right, so if he's on a month to month basis, there is so much he can do and no more probably. Mm -hmm. On the issue of indigenous rights, uh, 169, as was suggested, it probably is a good thing for the government to, um, to ratify 169 because in dealing with our indigenous people, you have to operate on the basis that they have human rights and legal rights and civil rights. And so what um, in, in Guyana, for instance, there has been more of a paternalistic approach to our indigenous populations and we give them handouts, we give them solar panel, we give them four wheelers, especially at election time to get their votes. But what we do and the way we govern should be on the basis of uh, the, the civil rights, the human rights, the, the UN rights. And the Isazu Treaty, again, 
like Ms. Rina likes to tell me the civil and the regulatory and the legal framework is very important as a foundation to help organize everything. And so sometimes you need good, good, good for frameworks and more frameworks, but more importantly, if we already have frameworks, how can we enforce them and put them into action and, and uh, be in compliance? And so that, that's very essential because you may have a whole lot of framework, but if, if the government is not bent on being transparent and account accountable, then it means that civil society would have to mobilize to, um, to get around whatever barriers the government might be um, putting up in the way. But governments need to understand that we are partners in development. The people and government are partners in development. We are not adversaries. And as I like to say, a hole in the boat is a hole in the whole boat. And so we all have to work together on this. Thank you very much, Thierry. I think this group already pointed out some opportunities, but also some challenges in the, in the context. Uh, we would invite the next group and uh, also invite them to, to add on what has already been said. So if some things that you also discussed have already been said, you can just go quick through that point and, and uh, add a bit more on the other points, please, so that we go building up just more. One, just one quick question. When do we clarify what Jerry said? At the end of it all or no? I would suggest we listen to the four presentations and then we can reinforce uh, the, the main ideas that have come up. Thank you. If that's okay. So this group, group two, who would like to present? Yeah, from my group will be Garfield. Uh, so he's going to talk about this. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you can see, our group had a lot of spirited discussion, so we didn't even get to the other two. We just focused more of our discussion around EITI. Um, I am from Guyana. Comfort and Arts in Region 6. And we basically talked about using the EITI report to engage persons across the country and not just in a particular region or district as it relates to getting them involved, um, getting them informed, and holding government accountable. I can tell you, being from Guyana, that a lot of this discussion the previous presenter rightly pre uh, point out that oil and gas is new in Guyana. And what we would have found is that a lot of the discussion centered in and around region four. That's where most of the activity is. And that's where the multinational operates. And that's where all of the important organs of our government operate. And persons in rural communities like region five, region six, and communities that might be considered on the periphery they are not engaged, they are not informed. And this is an important issue because uh, Ozzy pointed out that the oil and gas sector and the other extractive sector does not necessarily belong, rightly so, belongs to a government or a multinational, but it's for the people of the country and everyone has a stake in terms of getting involved and getting answers and ensuring that the this, this sector is managed in a transparent way. So what we would have found being from a rural region, which is region six, a lot of the persons in the regions, in the rural regions and in communities across the rural regions, they are not adequately informed and they are not adequately involved. So we spoke a lot about using that report to get persons involved and get them engaged and help them to get answers. We also spoke about the need for a strong civil society not just a strong civil society, but an independent civil society. Because if the civil society or, or if civil society organizations on the one hand are being funded and compensated by government, then that's an inherent conflict of interest. And then the need for them to hold government accountable then becomes compromised. So we talked about the need for an independent civil society and the need for civil society organizations to have the capacity necessary to hold government accountable and to inform the populace uh, of the country. And I think that this point is more relevant for civil society you know, uh, organizations in Guyana because oil and gas is new in Guyana. So there is a need for capacity uh, 
among civil society organizations uh, in Guyana. So most of our discussion was focused on this first one, so we didn't necessarily get to the other two. So thank you. Thank you. No, I think it's very interesting because you reflected on how AT can also be an instrument to, to articulate and to strength, strengthen civil society, uh, independent on how, uh, how the government will re react to that. It's already an, an, an objective, a goal in itself to, to um, have a stronger independent civil society. And if this instrument can help to build that, then they're also useful. Thank you. I suggest we go to the next group. Ooh. That, that's mine, that's my group. Uh, well, I will present three, you can see, you can all see the screen, right? So in my, in my group, we, we have uh, discussed about the importance of these international treaties and how these international tools are helpful to not only to raise awareness about these uh, topics, but also to change the political will in our uh, countries. So there was an agreement in the group that there is a lack of public awareness about these treaties and the topics on them. Um, some, some of people mentioned that, for example, Escazú Treaty was new for them. They were not aware about uh, the implications uh, on, on each country of these treaties, et cetera. So we all agree that it's important to not only to know this treaty, but also disseminate the information about it. Uh, not only with local communities or indigenous uh, community, but also with other stakeholders such as civil society, university, social groups, legislature, etc. So this information needs to be disseminated among all these stakeholders that, that was mentioned, uh, that was pointed as a priority. In fact, that's a great challenge for, for the region. Um, and that applies not only to ITI or indigenous People's Rights Convention, but also to ESCASU and other international treaties. So that was a, a first point. Um, another important point was about the political will of each government that was mentioned as a huge challenge in different countries. Uh, for example, uh, there was a representative of Guyana and he mentioned that in Guyana, for example, there is not a problem for ratifying treaties or, or recognized treaties, but the problem is actually to implement this on the ground, you know, to, to really change the political will to do something besides uh, uh, beyond the ratification of the, of the instrument. So uh, just answering the, the, the main question, how can you apply these tools in your reality? So we, we all agree that these instruments, uh, this legislation, it only becomes helpful when you uh, associate this legislation with a sector that you are working on in your organization. So if you're working on land issues, deforestation, et cetera, you, you need to uh, associate and relate this uh, international framework. You need to use this information in order to, to enrich your, your advocacy agenda, etc. So it's only helpful in the particular case. So that's why it's so important to have this information, to share this knowledge and to, to inform uh, stakeholders to take action in their particular fields. So that was, in general, the discussion in my group. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much. So there we go to the last group. Um, Veronica, do you want to present or somebody else of your group? Um, yes, I don't know if Frederick or Neil would want to present. If not, I can do it. Okay, um, I will um, present and uh, anyone Wait. can supplement. Um, what I will um, say. Um, our group um, zeroed in. We focused on the issue of information. This is what came out in several of the discussions that um, we um, noticed. So that there is a um, need, we said, the speakers identified for uh, freedom of information and information about so many things. And so the question in Guyana, 
we said that um, in our group that the government decides what information it will release, if any. And that is under the current um, version of what is called an Access to Information Act. And so this parsimonious release of information that the government feels it, will, it should give and hold back what it wants is pretty evident from the letters in the press and from those citizens who have been asking for information about several business ventures that touch their lives. So the question that we move to, apart from recognizing where we are in Guyana, we anticipated the next stage is that even if we are granted that information, are the people in a position to understand what the information means? Because if the government decides that that's not what the information means, even when they, they give it, then we have a problem. And we cited the case of President Bolsonaro in Brazil. He disputes the meaning of the smoke that was turning Sao Paulo dark last year. It was clear to the environmentalists that there was a severe increase in destruction of the Amazon. Yet Bolsonaro said that the accusations had a political basis. So you, you, can, you, you have two stages. One, in Guyana, we have to be able to get the information. And then when we get the information, we have to be prepared for the contention from those who see it in their interest to say that the information does not mean what others say that it means there's an argument. So that's a problem we need to anticipate. And secondly, given that we have a problem of getting information we need, it is a pity that we are also divided by language. I'm speaking about the attendees to the conference uh, from different parts of the, the world having the same problem. This is the same region. And so it is proposed that we in civil society collaborate more by sharing information with each other. Example, Suriname civil society with Guyana. Um, Surin Surinamese, every educated Surinamese speaks English. Um, and so it is quite possible for us to have uh, a, a sharing of information if we um, organize to do that. And I believe that um, even though um, Veronica is from uh, Peru, I think she said, um, she speaks English and we can also share information. So we can begin to beat the problem by, 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 by sharing information, the little information that we have. So that, those are our points. Perhaps others might want to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Frederick, for the presentation. Um, and for all the groups, I hope this was a useful uh, moment for you to, to interchange, uh, to exchange the visions and the um, challenges and opportunities that these sort of instruments uh, bring to our countries. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time left for an more, uh, more discussion on this, on this uh, group work, but you have the link so you can all go back to this, uh, these slides and you can reflect on them and you can share, well, share them within your organizations. Um, we are getting to the closing now. We would like to ask you uh, when we when the session finishes to fill in just three more questions in a Mentimeter that it will work and that we will uh, close uh, when well, we share in the chat right now, but that will be after the session because the session really has to finish at one o'clock. Um, and well, thanks everybody for all the all the input and, and all the reflection and the questions uh, that has been helpful for everybody to, to understand more about these, these complex instruments and how they can be useful. I will uh, give the word to Alejandra now to close this, this last session. Thank you, Susan. Uh, also, I wanted to remind you that in the chat, they are sending a survey about the workshop so you can answer how do you feel in this workshop if you like it and another stuff so well i just wanted to take this space to thank all the assistants and organizers i hope that everything we discussed today you can take it with you and you can start your own conversations in your organizations uh, from today i just want to highlight the importance of civil society's work in all of these spaces and the importance that we keep strengthening and we keep the independence of our civil society and lastly, I just wanted to remind you that you can reach Dar in Peru and we can keep straining our 
uh, alliances. And if you need any help with anything, we are here to help with each other in our work that we do. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. And I will give time uh, to Rina so she can talk to you a little bit more about the grants also that they are giving to help with civil society's work and to close the workshop. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Alejandra. I guess to begin with, uh, you know, on behalf of the guest project and the guest team, I would really like to thank all of you for your active participation. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm very glad we had a wonderful turnout today and I hope this was very valuable to you all. I also want to give a very special thank you to DAR, who this is their second day of hosting wonderful events and the facilitators. You a fantastic job and thank you very much. On, uh, on closing, um, I do hope that you do not forget that this is not the last day of Transparency Week. We still have tomorrow and we still have some exciting events. So please do join us. I know that Kitty who has been working very hard facilitating as well on behalf of the Extractives Week has been putting some links into the, um, into the chat. So please check those out. Uh, to sign off, I would like to encourage you now that you've had a chance to uh, hear a little bit more and learn a little bit more and share some exciting information between each other. I would like to encourage you to um, apply for our guest PADF small grants, which are funded by USAID. Um, if you require further information on this, it is on the website. So where you went to register on our um, microsite there, you will note that it says small grants. Uh, there you go. Uh, Kitty's helping me out here. <laughs> Great. So you can see there's all the information you require. Um, there's some links there that you can link into and receive the guidelines. Um, we do plan on having sort of a working session uh, and we will confirm with those people that are interested. Please again, send us an email, but we will confirm with you uh, a date where we will hold a mini workshop to explain a little bit more about the grants and uh, sort of our expectation in and around those grants. But we're hoping that today uh, will spark your enthusiasm in passing the word about governance and transparency in the extractive sector and that you will send a proposal our way. So uh, once again, please have a look at that. There are also small grants for journalists. So encourage any journalism friends that you may have to uh, submit a grant as well for that. So uh, thank you again, everyone. Um, and thanks to our team as well. I know the people that are behind the scenes that you don't often see, they've been very busy too. So thank you to everyone and have a lovely day. We'll see you soon. See you tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone.